Hi, this is Nicholas Bell with Ion Cinema, here to review The Devil All the Time, uh, which was released uh, in select theaters September 11, 2020, and will be available to stream on Netflix as of September 16, 2020. It is the fourth feature directed by Antonio Campos, which of course follows After School, Simon Killer, Christine, and now this adaptation of Donald Ray Pollock's 2011 debut novel. Uh, Mr. Pollock is also providing the omniscient narration, which works quite well. Uh, it is nearly a two and a half hour film uh, in what I would call a, a great contemporary example of uh, southern gothic saga. It's a bit William Faulkner meets uh, Bret Easton Ellis in its execution. Um, it takes place in southern Ohio and West Virginia in two distinct uh, years, 1957 and 1965. It's technically three different uh, distinctive storylines as well that converge for the final act. There is a lot going on and to say that it is a um, meaty narrative is uh, probably an understatement. Uh, but in short, it's really about the tale of Arvin Russell, uh, who eventually comes to be played by Tom Holland. Uh, his youth uh, in 1957, uh, Knock'em Stiff, Ohio, uh, shows the trauma born out of his father, played by Bill Sarsgaard, uh, having suffering from post-traumatic stress, having served in the war, uh, and his mother, who dies of cancer, played by Haley Bennett. Uh, there's a, a distinct scene in a diner where Haley Bennett and Bill Sarsgaard meet, and we're also introduced to these other strands of storyline. Uh, Mia Wasikowska plays Helen, this orphan young woman. Um, who's in the diner. Jason Clark plays Carl Henderson, uh, who's also, he's wooing the other waitress, played by Riley Keough, Sandy. Sandy is the sister of the, uh, who will come to be the sheriff, played by Sebastian Stan. Um, and all of these uh, converge across uh, a violent landscape of uh, trauma, despair, and tragedy. Uh, that's probably better just to sit down and watch, but it does uh, feel very complex, like, uh, like reading Tolstoy, you should probably write out a little family tree or diagram to keep track of everything going on. Uh, so Campos, uh, who adapted with Paolo Campos, should be uh, commended for uh, turning this into something that's cohesive and understandable uh, in ostensibly something that could have very easily been turned into uh, a miniseries. That said, there do seem to be some um, character development background things that due to the running time just couldn't be added uh, that but but that are also lacking such as uh, two of those characters I mentioned end up being a serial, a serial killing couple uh, who are very fascinating but we don't really ever get into their psychology uh, the female maybe a little bit more in the fact that we learn that she wants to stop doing this uh, but in one of the most fascinating parts of the story we're totally in the dark about really what's going on there. Uh, that said, uh, if uh, over the, a, th a, thro a through line, I think, would be something about how the war, the after effects of men returning from the war and uh, our inability to care for them or even have any kind of uh, dialogue or medical assistance created these fraction, uh, fractured human beings and generational trauma that would uh, mix inextricably with a religious facade. There's there's an awful lot going on here about what a sham uh, religion is and what a shyster. Uh, Robert Pattinson's character comes in the third act as this uh, young preacher, or young reverend, who seduces Eliza Scanlon's Lenora, who's the younger adopted sister of uh, Arvin Russell, uh, and the resulting, of course, uh, events that happen from that. Uh, it reminded me a lot of Night of the Hunter, like these two children have grown up in this uh, traumatic environment and kind of the limited options available to them. Uh, Pattinson is interesting and potentially a distraction, uh, but it's not unlike, I would say, Marlon Brando cast in Tennessee Williams' uh, The Fugitive Kind uh, in that uh, film version. Um, however, there is, it, it would, it would have benefited from not only a little more character development, from, but from a, being a bit more lurid and gritty. We don't really get the sweat and blood and despite there being horrific moments of violence, there is not uh, resulting recoil that you should feel from what's going on in these people's lives. Kind of like 
say, the opening moments of Mississippi Burning. Um, that said, uh, it is an entertaining film. It's probably the most ambitious uh, tackling uh, of Campos yet, uh, of the borderline film crew, uh, all of whose films are definitely worth a watch. Josh Mahan, Sean Durkin, Nicholas Pesch, etc. Uh, you're always going to uh, run into something conversation-worthy and uh, surprising uh, across all of their output. Uh, overall, I would give this three and a half out of five stars. Thank you. Hey, this is Eric from MyOwnCinema.com. If you want to support us, subscribe below. For more reviews, interviews, film festival coverage from Sundance, Cannes, Toronto, you want to check out these guys on this side.